Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Mark Green, the director and CEO of the Wilson Center. As many of you know, we are unique in this town. We are congressionally chartered, scholarship-driven, and uh, fiercely, some would say, religiously nonpartisan. Just as importantly, we're inquisitive. We care about ideas, and we believe in American engagement. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome the Honorable John Healy here to the Wilson Center today. He has been a member of the UK's Parliament uh, for the Labour Party since he was elected first in 1997. He soon joined the Chancellor of the Exchequer's team working for Gordon Brown. No surprise, he later on took two jobs at Treasury, first Economic Secretary and then Financial Secretary. With that economic experience, the Labour government then asked John Healy to focus on domestic issues. He was Minister of State for Local Government and later Housing. When Labour moved into opposition following the 2010 election, John continued his work on housing and then on health, two challenges, very complex but terribly important in so many ways. In April 2020, he took on his current role, Shadow Secretary of State for Defense. Obviously, especially from our perspective, defense is always one of the most important areas of policy and leadership, but there have been few periods where it has been more important than right now. Important for the UK, important for all of Europe, indeed important for the entire world. European and transatlantic institutions have faced their challenges in modern times. Not so long ago, some critics even suggested that they were sliding towards irrelevance. I'm not so sure they'd make those arguments today. There's a lot going on, and there is a lot at stake. And that makes our dialogue today all the more important. We're looking forward to a vibrant discussion on the security challenges we face together as transatlantic partners and of the resources we all need to bring to take them head on. And to get the conversation underway, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Robin Quinville, Director of the Global Europe Program, and she'll get us going. Robin, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. I actually believe that the interest is very high in hearing what our speaker has to say. So without further ado, please come and give us your views. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you for that um, over generous introduction. I, had, I have to say your distinguished career in development and diplomacy uh, over the years has been a model on how to wield influence but also win affection and respect and it's uh, a, a great role that you now play uh, doing very similar with the Wilson Centre and Dr Quinville thank you very much for your welcome I have to say it's a huge thank you to the Wilson Centre for hosting us this morning I'm really honoured that the first event on my first visit to the US as uh, Britain's Shadow Defence Secretary should be here with you. And uh, very much in the spirit of uh, the Wilson Centre, this is an event that aims to be an exchange of ideas and views. Uh, so I look forward to what you all have to say, uh, both in person and online. Thank you uh, for your time this morning. Britain, over the other side, is now at the business end of our political cycle with a general election which could come any time in the next two years. And I have to say over the last month, Labour has been hugely helped by the new Prime Minister and Chancellor. But even before Liz Truss, back in the summer, Labour was consistently polling a full nine or ten points ahead of the Conservatives. Now, Keir Starmer would be the first to say there is a great deal more to do, but I think this is nevertheless a remarkable restoration of public confidence in Labour under his leadership. Because if you consider that it was less than three years ago, at the last general election, when Labour suffered its worst result and defeat since 1935. And as part of that defeat, Labour trailed the Conservatives on defence by 61 points. 
And that led Keir Starmer to pledge early on in his leadership, never again will Labour go into an election not trusted on national security. And Keir and I, as Ambassador has kindly said, have both served in government. We know the first duty of any government is to defend the country and keep its citizens safe. We also know it's the public's first test of any party aspiring to government. So today, if I may, Dr Quinville, I'd like to do three things. First, to underline Labour's unshakable commitment to our NATO allies, especially to the US. Secondly, set out the areas of British continuity and Labour change that you might expect if we have a Labour government after the next election. And thirdly, and above all, to listen to the analysis and advice that you, this American audience with such expertise, can offer to the discussion this morning. So this centre, of course, um, named after the wartime president, Woodrow Wilson, uh, in many ways, I think he was something of a visionary. He's speaking in England after the end of the First World War. He said that he hoped that Great Britain and the US, he said, with other like-minded European powers, would enter into a great league and covenant, declaring ourselves friends of mankind and uniting ourselves together for the maintenance and the triumph of right. Well, it took the horrors of the Second World War before the international institutions and law, led by the US and the UK, were established to guarantee the sovereignty of nations and universal human rights. And NATO itself, the most successful alliance in history, embodies democracy, individual freedom and peace within its founding articles alongside collective defense. And these are the values the Ukrainians are fighting for so fiercely at the moment. These are the values that authoritarian leaders like Putin target so relentlessly. And President Zelensky was right when back in March he said, the war in Ukraine is a war in general for these values. So this is a war all over the world, he told us. And Putin is fighting his current war in Ukraine but he's also waging his wider hybrid war on the West, as he has been for years, though we've been slow to see it and even slower to level with the public. The high energy costs in Europe are not a direct result of the war in Ukraine. They're an essential element of it. And it's no coincidence that Russia reduced by 25% gas supplies to Europe in the year before he invaded Ukraine. He wants to divide NATO, he wants to hold Europe hostage on energy, and he wants to flood our societies with disinformation to persuade our own people that democracy is simply not worth it. And he may be losing the military battle, but he still believes he can bully the West into softening support for Ukraine and leaning on Zelensky for a ceasefire. And I say to those in your country and in ours, those who call stop the war more loudly than win the war, they're playing into Putin's hands. Because a ceasefire now cedes new territory to Russia. It risks Russia deepening its occupation, regrouping its forces, and legitimising its regime of torture, rape and executions. Putin is losing this war in Ukraine. He's losing face as the strongman leader of a strong country. The second biggest army in the world is now the second best army in Ukraine. And this is a tribute to the huge bravery of the Ukrainians, civilians and military alike. But it's also a tribute to the essential military and economic support to Ukraine led by the United States and backed by 40 other countries. So today from Britain, I want to thank President Biden. I want to thank the US for your leadership during this crisis. You know, when I was in Kyiv in January, 
just before Putin invaded. The former Prime Minister, Arsene Yasenik, said to me, Western unity is Ukraine's best defence. And I was able to tell him then that there would be total unity in Britain, united UK support for Ukraine, and united UK condemnation of Russian attacks. So on Britain's military help for Ukraine, and on reinforcing NATO allies on the Russian border, the British government has had and will continue to have Labour's fullest support as the official opposition. And with the general election, there may well be a change to Labour, but there will be no change to Britain's resolve in confronting Russian aggression and standing with Ukraine. And it seems to me that our duty now is to make sure that Ukraine wins this war. This means providing the military support required, but it also moves, means moving beyond the ad hoc announcements of new weapons deliveries to laying out a long-term strategy for military, economic and diplomatic assistance throughout 2023 and beyond. This would reassure the Ukrainians, but it would also reinforce the message to Putin that things will get worse, not better, for Russia. Now, the Ukraine invasion has brought home, I think, the abiding importance, as the ambassador said to us, the abiding importance of NATO to generations who have never known conflict in Europe and who could never have conceived of war in Europe. In the UK, the public support for NATO over the last year has gone up to 80%. And Labour is the party of NATO. We're proud that Attlee and Bevan forged its founding charter in 1949, including Article 5. We have an unshakable commitment to NATO and to our independent UK deterrent, which we maintain also on behalf of NATO allies. And we believe that the first priority for Britain's armed forces must be where the threats are greatest, not where the business opportunities lie. This is in the NATO area. This is our primary obligation to our closest allies. And so our Labour mission in government will be to ensure that Britain is NATO's leading European nation, recognising now that European allies have to take more responsibility for European security after Ukraine. So we'd work on more collaborative tech, investment, deeper in interoperability, more mutual force development, better complementary relations with the UK, uh, with the European Union, and greater use of the Joint Expeditionary Force. We'd want to focus, a new focus on areas for future Russian aggression, on plans to respond as the Arctic opens up, and on a strategy to challenge and compete with China. However, I have to say, and some of these questions have come from the United States. There are growing questions over critical capabilities that threaten to undermine the UK's commitment to the alliance. Unresolved problems with the Ajax armoured vehicles. Delays to wedge-tail surveillance planes. Indecision over new Navy support ships. And doubts about the Army's ability to field a modern warfighting division. So Labour would apply a NATO test to all major defence projects in our first 100 days. We use it to check that the UK is meeting its obligations to the Alliance in full. If there are capability gaps, we will fill them. If there are funding gaps, we will fix them. If there are tough decisions, we will take them. And we will make sure that Britain's NATO obligations are back on track. This is what our unshakable commitment to NATO means in practice. So post-election, with a Labour government in Britain, we will ensure continuity on support for Ukraine and confronting Russian aggression, continuity plus on NATO commitments, and continuity plus on AUKUS. Like Labour in Australia, we strongly welcomed the AUKUS agreement, like Labour in Australia, we want to explore ways that this pact can be expanded out from subs and hypersonics 
to areas such as space and autonomous technology. And post-election, with a Labour government, we'd lead changes to design to strengthen our own security and make Britain democracy's most reliable ally. What does this mean? First, we'd fix the European-shaped hole in the UK's global Britain strategy, and we'd rebuild alliances to make Brexit work. We'd strike new defence and security agreements with the EU and pursue new defence cooperation with key European NATO allies. We'd make preventing climate change a top priority for our national security and international action. We'd direct British defence investment first to British industry to strengthen our UK economy and our UK sovereignty and overhaul our wasteful peacetime procurement system. And we'd build up the resilience of British democracy to deal with the attacks in cyber, disinformation, terrorism, organised crime. So finally, let me turn to US-UK relations. For Labour, the US is the UK's most important international ally, and the UK will remain the US's closest security ally. We are partners of choice. We share the same values. We see the same threats. We've been in this together for decades. And while there were certainly notable flaws in the UK's integrated review of foreign policy and defence policy, it rightly reaffirmed last year, the UK's influence will be amplified by stronger alliances and wider partnerships, none more valuable to British citizens than our relationship with the United States. Yet no one in the British government or the British Parliament is asking how do we strengthen the UK's relationship with the United States over the next decade. And you know, back home in Westminster, I co-chair the British American Parliamentary Group. It's been going since 1937. It fosters close relations between our Parliament and your Congress. And every year, on every exchange programme, politicians of all parties, both sides of the Atlantic, rehearse warm tributes to that special relationship. It is special, but like any relationship, it's based on mutual trust and respect, which need to be refreshed and reaffirmed. So my interest in hearing from you on security, on defence diplomacy, on de democratic resilience, on tech development, on intelligence sharing, arms controls, global alliance building. My interest in hearing is what is America's view on the UK's role in the world? What more can we do together to tackle threats and challenges that we share, especially on China? How do we future-proof that special relationship? In other words, what Woodrow Wilson termed our common devotion to right at the heart of that special relationship between the US and the UK. How can this be reinforced for the future as a force for good in the world? I'm proud of the record of the last Labour government on peace, defence and security. We brokered the Good Friday Agreement. We sent troops to secure pre peace in Kosovo. We fought alongside you after the 9-11 tax against extremist terrorism. We spent well above NATO commitments on defence. We doubled development aid. We passed the world's first ever Climate Change Act. We maintained the size of the British infantry throughout the 13 years of a Labour government. We ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So I'm proud of the record of the last Labour government and I'm ambitious for what we can achieve in the next. A confident country, worth defending and determined to defend itself. Thank you. So here's how this is going to go. We're going to have a little conversation 
and then I'm going to roll into your questions, okay? So never fear, you will get a chance to ask those questions. Save them up as we have a chat, thanks. Okay. All right, have some water. Thank you. <laughs> First, welcome to the Wilson Center and we are delighted that you were able to be with us today. I'd like to start by turning to something that is dealing with your background at the Treasury and your current portfolio at Defense. We have seen over time a number of budget cuts, um, especially in, uh, in the years when austerity budgeting was hitting every department in the UK. Um, and that's had an effect on capabilities and defense investment. Can you talk to us a little bit about that impact that you've seen and what your approach to defense spending would be? Yes. Um, straightforwardly, you're, you're, you're right to identify a decade of um, defense cuts. Uh, it was consistent with, from 2010 onwards, a government that wanted and, and imposed an austerity across public spending. Um, the, the, the direct result is that uh, we have 40,000 fewer full-time troops. Um, one in five of the Navy's surface ships are, are taken mm -hmm. out of service. And uh, over 200 RAF planes have been decommissioned in the last five years alone. And the impact on that is that satisfaction is with service life in Britain has dropped below half for the first time ever. So um, government decisions, uh, their prerogative, but with a real impact on defence, which was why when uh, the government announced in t November 2020 a big capital boost of £16.5 billion pounds over these three years for defence, we welcomed that. It was catch-up spending. Um, a good deal of it um, has gone to plug a £17 billion black hole in the defence budget uh, that was there at the mm -hmm. time. But what it has meant was that at least Britain's NATO commitment didn't drop below the 2% of GDP, which it was set to do. And I think probably the reason that government made that budget commitment um, uniquely outside the general three yearly cycle of um, spending review and commitments, which a government does for um, all departments together. Labour's approach will quite simply be what it's been in the past. Labour will spend what's required on defence. What's required on defence uh, depends on the threats. Mm -hmm. So immediately after the 9-11 terror attacks, in government then we brought in the largest sustained increase in defence spending for over two decades. We maintained levels of spending. I mentioned the level of infantry troops throughout that 13 years of Labour government. So in our last year in, in government, we spent 2.5% uh, of GDP on defence. Um, once that had worked through, that has not been matched. And the, over the last 12 years, we've never seen more than 2.2% uh, on GDP. So the, 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 task, the, the task for me is both how much we spend Mm -hmm. And from opposition, it is hard to call the precise figures needed without the ability to assess the threats, evaluate the intelligence, get the advice that is the prerogative and exclusive prerogative of the party and the government in power. Um, the second question is not just how much you spend, but how well you spend it. Mm -hmm. And... I make this as a general observation because we had we had we 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 had procurement failures of our own, but the scale of confirmed waste um, that we've had through MS MODs misjudgment or mismanagement of defence programmes means that we are wasting billions and failing the frontline troops as well as the British taxpayers. So on day one, we said already that we would get our. National Audit Office, if you like, that's our independent um, audit audit uh, office 
that uh, reports to Parliament, uh, not to the government, we'd bring them into the MOD and do an audit of waste f from day one. And secondly, we would kick off a defence and security review of our own, building, I hope, on the refreshed integrated review that the government currently uh, is has, has started. But we would do that, and then I think some of the detailed decisions we'd make, including on funding, would follow from that. I see. Okay. Um, you mentioned that spending needs to follow the threat assessment, and uh, and I think that for all of us, we are interested in in hearing your uh, your assessment of what the main challenges are ahead yeah. in the next maybe twelve months or two years out, whichever you'd like to choose as a time frame. Well, I guess uh, I guess Robin, the um, I think the main the, the main threats as we see them and I see them were uh, re reflected in the main areas that I tried to set out in my short speech of uh, British continuity and labour change, if you like. Um, th there's one area that I touched on, which I think doesn't doesn't yet command the attention required, and that is essentially the we're, we're faced with adversaries who are threatening not just our national security, but attacking our uh, society our democracy, our very way of life. And they are spending their time trying to divide, uh, divide us, um, to degrade our own sense of commitment to our country and our democracy. I mean, it was your US State Department, I think, recently that published figures that uh, identified $300 million spent by Russia since 2014 uh, in trying to uh, undermine democratic uh, elections. That's the sort of scale of what we're up against, and yet we don't have any systematic way of um, monitoring that, reporting and informing that, um, and crucially, making sure that some of the responses required to that are properly undertaken. And I um, argued in the uh, run-up to the um, the new NATO strategic concept, that NATO itself should take a more serious uh, look at this because ultimately this is about our ability to defend our country. Um, and short of that, I would really like to see us look at the possibility of some sort of US-UK joint democratic resilience center. Um, I'd obviously like that to be a sort of biden Starmer. Uh, announcement, but more importantly, I'd like to see it happen. I think it, we, you could sm sketch out the mission for that, which would be to, to monitor the actions of adversaries, to report on those, to make sure that the agencies, business, um, civil society w knew the nature of the threats that we face, and crucially would be part of, if you like, holding a yardstick to ensure that some of the proper responses were being made and um, I think the UK and the US with our shared values, our shared um, trust are ideally placed to that, our shared experiences of having adversaries um, try to undermine the fabric of our society and the uh, uh, cohesion um, and it could be something obviously then that other countries that wanted to participate and contribute could easily lock into as well. Um, so it may be an, un, an unexpected answer in terms of threats, but in addition to what I perhaps set out in headline terms in my short speech, I think there's an area here for us that we've not yet taken seriously um, in the way that certainly some of our adversaries led, but no means exclusively, uh, including Putin, have, uh, have, been, have been pursuing for some time, to our cost and to his success. I'm sure our listeners are, are taking note of the proposed initiative for this. Uh, I'd like to turn to the um, UK's integrated review because sure. you mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, and I'm sure that our well-informed audience knows about this initiative that, that dated to 2021 that I understand is going to now go through a, um, an update under Prime Minister Truss. Uh, in, in it, it promised the biggest investment in defense 
since the end of the Cold War and suggested that the strategy would be one of persistent global engagement. Um, tell us what you think of the idea of, uh, of a, re a review of the review now under the new prime minister. Mm -hmm. And what, in your view, did that integrated review get right? And maybe okay. what did it get wrong, in, in your view? What would you seek to, uh, to look at anew? Yeah. Um, I'm very pleased and we've welcomed the review. Um, I'd been arguing that this was required f for um, nearly a year. Um, certainly since the um, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which was not uh, foreseen in that uh, integrated review, when you've got 20 other countries, NATO countries, that have rebooted their defense plans and defense spending, um, we needed to do the same. I'd like I'd like to be the I'd like this to be a review that any future government, uh, particularly if it's a Labour government, could build. Mm -hmm. I'd like this to be um, Britain's strategy for a global Britain, not just the Conservatives' strategy for a global Britain because they happen to be in government. And in many ways, the gold standard for in uh, certainly UK side for the way that these um, strategic reviews have been conducted was back in 1998 when Labour led that by um, George Robertson, who became Secretary General of NATO after that. It was expansive, it was consultative, and actually opposition parties were brought in, so you had a bipartisan support hardwired into the recommendations and the strategy that was then produced. And I think, particularly in these circumstances, that would be good for Britain, and it would be good for our allies. Um, what did it get right? Well, it certainly got right the identification of Russia as um, the UK and um, uh, our European, European neighbours' most acute threat. Um, it was right to flag the uh, what then NATO in its um, uh, future concept described as China as a sort of full-scale systemic rival. Uh, there were some inconsistencies, less with the integrated review and more with the um, Mil Ministry of Defence's plan to reflect the integrated review because it if you want to be globally forward, if you want to be persistently globally uh, deployed and forward deployed, then it doesn't make sense to cut your entire fleet of heavy transport planes this year. Um, there are question marks as it, the threats are increasing, particularly as NATO is stepping up its um, uh, uh, high readiness force from 40,000 to 300,000 and yet you've got still a government um, in Britain that can't be dissuaded from a plan to cut a further 10,000 troops from the British Army over the next three years. So there are some inconsistencies that I hope will get ironed out. The big budget boost that was linked to the integrated review was that announcement back in 2020 which I've explained in many ways was catch-up funding after a decade of uh, uh, of cuts which the Prime Minister at the time described as the era of decline uh, or the era of retreat. So um, I think the, the the review is good. Uh, the sort of changes I think are reflected in my um, short speech to you. So I think the main flaws were first of all I hope we'll get beyond this, but 18 months ago, um, the British government wasn't able to talk about Europe and the European Union, so there's a Europe-shaped hole in the middle of the uh, integrated review strategy. There was a um, commitment to confronting Russia, a recognition that they posed the most acute threat, and clearly that has, that has been intensified, but no clear... No clear uh, plan for how Britain looks to contribute to NATO, to work with NATO allies. Um, uh, and so I think those are the sorts of areas that I would, uh, would, would want to see. And then, then finally, I think this is also an opportunity to do more to recognize some of the long, longer term uh, changes that will come with climate change, and in particular, the opening up of the Arctic. And uh, I, I think building on the excellent um, military uh, relationships 
led by Britain, we've now established with the, Bal the Baltic and the Nordic, Nordic countries, um, I think there's a great deal more that uh, the UK could do um, within and alongside NATO to uh, prepare for that as well. Thank you so much. I see and I hear a little bit of uh, audience uh, restlessness on this, so <laughs> I'm going to... Restlessness, okay. Yeah, that restlessness means, Robin, you're going to ask all the questions? No. It probably a, means uh, get Healy to be a bit shorter in his answer. No, it means, Robin, you're hogging the floor. And so what I'd like to do at this point is to open the floor for questions. Um, and I have a couple com that have come in uh, online, but rec in recognition of the fact that we're actually in a room together, I want to take a couple of these from the floor. And what I'd like to do, and I hope this is all right with you, sir, is to, to take two or three, bundle them together, and, uh, and then you can... Yeah, of course. Them. All right. So uh, to, well, I think we have a microphone somewhere. So, if not, stand up and uh, stand up and deliver. <laughs> All right, we'll go. We'll go online first. No problem. Um, so let me uh, let me give you a couple of these. First, um, and this is from Anthony Cordesman. How should Britain and the U.S. approach the need to shift NATO from focus on spending 2% of a nation's GDP and 20% of its total defense spending on equipment to making the country-by-country uh, -country force improvements needed to deal with an aggressive Russia? Um, and uh, then I'll, I'll add a couple of in there. Someone, someone paid very close attention to your, uh, to your proposal for a NATO test and, and is asking, will there also be an AUKUS test for the, that capability review? And then uh, finally, from uh, a colleague in Germany, uh, what is your stance on the UK's participation in the EU's PESCO program? Uh, what PESCO pro uh, project might the, the UK be interested in? So it's uh, it's all, I think, focused on the on the question of how to develop the capabilities of the future. Let me take them in reverse order and try and link them if that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure who asked the PESCO question, but um, so the, the the PESCO system is designed to keep non-European Union members out: U.S., Norway, Britain. It is incredibly bureaucratic uh, it is incredibly complex to play a part and it requires surrendering a great deal of the sort of intellectual um, uh, uh, ownership that you'd want to invest in a proper alliance system of um, tech development research um, testing um, of future systems and uh, security uh, security systems. We would really want to play a part. One of the consequences for the way that Brexit was done in Britain was that the original proposal that was um, Prime Minister May's proposal that defence and security would be part of the uh, general settlement with Britain um, uh, withdrawing from the European Union, but that was taken off the table by Prime Minister Johnson. So there is a an appetite on the European side. There is an imperative from the British side to do, as I said in my short speech there, to try and forge fresh agreements on defence and security with the European Union. We would look to do the same with certain key uh, European NATO allies, um, rather in the way that the Conservative government under Prime Minister Cameron did in 2010 with the Lancaster House Agreement with the French. Um, on on PESCO, um, we have a, what I think probably is best described as a, a sort of residual involvement in one project, which is to do with uh, transportation linked to um, uh, land forces. But I, I really hope that if we have the opportunity in government to open up that dialogue with the European Union, to rebuild some of the relationships that have been badly burned uh, with key European allies in the whole Brexit process and therefore make, make Brexit work for Britain better, 
I hope that we can look at um, uh, overhauling the PESCO arrangements so that not just Britain as a third party country, um, but potentially the US on certain projects and potentially Norway and others can participate, can contribute because we've got a great deal to, 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 to offer. That links to Anthony's question, if I may. What, what would be, how do we look to shift NATO off the, um, the simple 2% simple GDP test? The sort of areas that I think, um, and I hope the, expre the, the experience of sourcing um, weapons, systems, supplying Ukraine in this um, fight to defend its country against Putin, the strength and sense of NATO unity and determination would all help create the context in which um, through NATO we can really accelerate what's been talked about for a long time um, uh, on interoperability. I hope we can accelerate and expand the um, NATO scope for uh, tech development projects um, and not leave that necessarily entirely to the province of uh, a PESCO EU driven system and that we could look also to um, uh, mutual force development um, better military doctrine that allows us to operate more closely together um, and potentially procurement procurement uh, link ups where um, it makes sense to do do that uh, with with close allies and I think Anthony's question is exactly right. I hope we're going to see this emerge as some of the detail behind the um, uh, the new strategic concept I I is published in the next six w six months or so. But I hope we're going to see um, a more of a focus on uh, capability than funding commitment. Mm -hmm. And certainly, as I mentioned, the Joint Expeditionary Force that Britain established in 2014, I think, is a potentially a, a really powerful model for a um, flexible, responsive um, way of the allies within NATO who are willing um, to work together, respond together. And I think it's not a stretch to, 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 to see how, if, if, if properly developed within a broader NATO um, framework and strategic um, uh, decade-long frame, you could see the Joint Expeditionary Force becoming something of a sort of uh, joint force command for the north uh, part of uh, NATO and the Arctic and North Atlantic area. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the... Sorry, the AUKUS test. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Um, the purpose of my proposal and plan to do a NATO test is that there are um, growing questions about the shortfall between the obligations and commitments we've made to NATO and our confidence in our capacity as a country to deliver those. Um, that's the purpose of the NATO test. So it, it, uh, given that AUKUS is uh, still relatively new, being developed in concept rather than delivery at present, um, it, does, it doesn't, f to my mind, translate automatically as something that would be sensible or necessary to do. But if people have got other views, I'd be really interested in them. Yeah, I would too. I, I think one of the things about the integrated review that struck me was how much of it places an emphasis on the sort of science and technology development yes. of the future and seeing that as a strength that Britain brings to, uh, to its defense policy and to the world, which is why your, uh, your answer on PESCO intrigued me so much. Yes, you're quite right, um, uh, Robin. That that was a hallmark of, uh, and, and I think uh, absolutely uh, the the, uh, uh, the right um, emphasis. It's a, it's a t it is an area where Britain's got a contribution to make, but it requires a, a long-term commitment um, and the ability to put some of the sort of long-term public commitment alongside um, private investment to leverage leverage it to the full. Okay. And that would you'd certainly see that as a, as a, a hallmark and a feature of any uh, Labour-led defence and security review. Right. I think if I don't ask questions in the room now, there will be revolution. So I'm going to say, right, I, it appears we have a microphone so <coughs> that our online listeners can hear your question. Let's go for it. And please identify yourself, okay? Uh, well, I am Peter Suskin. Thank you so much for your talk today. 
Uh, you mentioned that it was more important to win the war in Ukraine than to stop it. So I was wondering whether you could tell us what a win would look like. Is it pushing the Russians back to the February 23rd borders out of the entirety of Donbass and Crimea? Uh, something else? Um, how likely is victory, however you define it? And uh, is there any limit to how long a labor government would support the war effort necessary to uh, achieve such a victory? Thanks. Let me take another question, too, and then I'm going to bundle one online question because it also comes to that. So, Rob Litvak. Thank you very much, uh, Shadows uh, Minister. Um, my question is uh, an issue that uh, defense officials in this country are grappling with, which is traditionally escalation in conflict Cold War, in the Cold War era was conceived of from conventional to nuclear. Now, um, a conflict uh, with an adversary could would likely begin in new domains, cyber or outer space. And I think that the integration conceptually and operationally of how the new domains are taken into account in defense planning is sort of an ongoing challenge. I was wondering w what what's the thinking uh, of in, in the UK on that? Okay. And let me bundle into this a qu an online question because it goes to Ukraine. Um, and this comes from Eugene Komarov, a journalist at the Voice of America Russian Service. How, how do Putin's nuclear blackmail and threats to use nuclear weapons against Ukraine affect British nuclear strategy? Uh, how will Bra Great Britain respond if Russia uses tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. That is a question. <laughs> we had a we had a contribution, an unscripted contribution from the floor saying that's a question. Um, the sh I think the short answer is that um, in any event that Putin was uh, moved to use such a weapon, um, inevitably the response would be led by the U.S. Um, so there's not a, the, 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 the nuclear saber rattling that Putin uh, is doing at the moment and did at the start of this invasion, it's important to remember, um, does not def not change our long-term commitment, Labour commitment and British commitment to the independent nuclear deterrent. It doesn't uh, change our commitment to uh, making that um, uh, av available as part of our uh, commitment to NATO allies. One of the arguments I have, um, it's partly because I've been around a while, um, with um, colleagues on the Labour shadow cabinet um, is that, and, 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 and politicians are always tempted to do this, uh, it's very tempting to be uh, weigh in with a view and essentially be commentators. When, uh, whether in opposition, certainly in government, I think there's responsibility for those who are uh, policy decision makers to be incredibly responsible and guarded against um, fueling the rhetoric, particularly when it's being used by Russia and by Putin to try and escalate anxiety um, and to uh, cloud the sort of clear thinking about uh, how the Ukrainian conflict is going and what Russia might, else might do. So I'm, I'm always very cautious about being drawn into a, a discussion about the what-ifs. Um, and I think your National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, has absolutely got this right. In a sense, it needs a very clear, firm declaration, as he's made, that UK, uh, uh, the US and your allies um, will respond decisively in any such event, and that the consequences for Russia will be catastrophic. Um, I imagine that that has been communicated not just publicly, but very powerfully privately. Um, and I think as a as, a, as, as, as the U.S.'s sort of closest ally, particularly on nuclear, and as a NATO ally, we row in behind that. Um, so that would that that would be the that would be, in a sense, the stance I'd take on the nuclear question. On Robin's um, question, 
What's the what's the UK's thinking on um, the, the new domains? Look, in some ways, if I'm honest, I can't really answer that. You know, I'm a um, I lead for Labour the, uh, in the oppos official opposition on on defence. But one of the things about defence, compared to some of the other briefs that the ambassador was kind enough in government and in opposition that I've held, is the the asymmetry in the US, UK system of government and opposition is so much more extreme in defence. So if you consider if you consider the defence and security field, the the the, inf the information about ad adversaries' actions, the assessment of threats, the uh, knowledge about the capabilities of our own defences systems, the agreements and understandings we have with allies, the spend uh, in huge areas is all entirely confidential or secret and not disclosed beyond the, um, uh, the, the, the realms of those at senior levels in, in government. It's not like that if you're leading on health or on uh, benefits or on uh, trade, um, for instance. So to give you an the, the asymmetry, if you like, is, is there are 8,000 civilians in the MOD head office in, in the UK. Um, there's me and Dan, who's really able, but essentially there's the two of us for the official opposition. So the, the mismatch um, is so much greater than uh, I think probably if you're used to a US system, you can even imagine. So look, I'm, I'm in a sense, I'm ducking the question because I, I really don't know the answer to, you know, what's the current UK thinking on new domains like space. Uh, what I will say to you is that I think as a as a as part of the new over the last couple of years, the government's thinking and commitment to uh, creating a space command is good. The commitment to the science and technology uh, increases is good, and part of that is directed at space. We've been shut out of some in really important contributions that we were making to um, the uh, European space space program. Um, and then finally, an observation that it may seem a hugely unpromising period to be talking about this, but in a sense, w when when the threats are greatest and the tensions are highest, the importance of not losing sight of the need to try and uh, maintain communication, uh, have uh, conflict risk reduction um, strategies in place, and to be opening up a debate, a serious debate about how the rules of conflict that we've established in the traditional domains can and should be translated to some of the new domains on cyber and space in particular and part of the part of the sort of historic pride I think I've, I have for the Labour Party on defence and security is ever since those days of the post-war Attlee government when we established the UK independent deterrent we've also if you like had a, a, a twin track with a commitment to try and do what we can to broker discussions about arms control and multilateral disarmament and in this case new rules uh, over conflict in uh, new domains and it's been it's been neglected in britain for some time you only need to look at the um, small um, uh, delegation that went to the uh, mpt review conference from the uk didn't include any uh, ministers to, to, to recognise that this is not an area where Britain's given much attention in recent years. Um, it does need some, certainly some attention and leadership. It needs it now more than ever. Um, and I, I would like to, I'd like to see a, if we get a change of government, I'd like to see Labour um, picking up that challenge as part of what are our, our, our sort of traditional commitment as a P5 member, a leading member of NATO and uh, some of the other uh, alliances there. I'm, I'm so, and I didn't, I didn't answer Peter's question, and I'm so sorry, I'm going on. What does WIN look like? Uh, do you know, I, thinking about it, in the UK, I don't think we've come up with a better a definition of the strategic aims than Lloyd Austin did here um, back in the summer. We well, said, first of all, um, we need to ensure that Ukraine um, wins this conflict 
and is able in the future to defend the integrity of its own territory by itself. And secondly, that uh, we need to contain and degrade Russia to the extent that it's not capable of mounting similar aggression towards other countries or to Ukraine uh, in future. So for, I think, f for me, that's a, that's, that's a good strategic aim that I, at the time, urged our UK government to be explicit and to adopt. Um, how long... How, how long does the Labour commitment last? There is no time limit on this. There's no conditions on this. Um, I think I hope I made clear in my talk that this isn't simply a question of, of, of uh, driving the Russian invasion back and out of Ukraine. This is a deeper, wider, longer-term battle. Um, and if we in the West can't maintain that unity that is Ukraine's best defence, but that unity and determination that is in our own best interests long term, um, then we'll be failing our we'll be failing our citizens and our country because uh, Putin will be back for more. I can take maybe one question uh, and one online. So over to you. I'm basically running beyond time. I know. We'll give it five minutes. Thank you so much, Shadow Minister, for a very thoughtful presentation. My name is Amit Ahuja. I'm a fellow here at the Wilson Center. Um, you have been an you know, observer of conservative politics. We've had three conservative prime ministers since the last Labour government. Traditionally, conservatives have tried to own the issue of defense. And yet, when we look at their behavior in government, uh, in a moment of worsening threat environment, they have really not sort of stepped up and spent more or invested more in defense. What do you think is actually going on? Has the traditional relationship between conservatives and the issue of defense, has that changed? And if I can bundle one little, one sure. little uh, partial question in here. Uh, someone has come in with a with a question uh, about the integrated review and whether there was sufficient focus on the global south and perhaps you could add that into your answer and then y'all if you didn't ask your question now that too bad because that will those will be the last questions and we'll have to wrap it up um, no there's not been sufficient attention on the on the global south um, I, th I think those early those early, vo early votes in the United Nations um, W was something of a, a wake-up call to, to the Western Alliance, um, the number of countries that sat on their hands. Um, I think the upcoming vote on um, in the in the General Assembly on the annexation, the illegal annexation of the four um, parts of Ukraine, will be a really key test. And certainly, I'm encouraged by the um, belated, but nevertheless, the uh, important recognition from the UK government, and I think it's there from the US as well. Um, that a great deal more needs to be done. Um, in part because certainly for the le last decade or more, China and Russia have been certainly stealing a march with many of the sort of global South allies um, that perhaps um, we might have taken for granted or taken to be with us in, in, in the past. Ahmed, um, really interesting question. Um, unfortunately, we've had four prime ministers in the last um, six years, not three. Um, has the relationship changed? Uh, can I answer this briefly in two ways? Um, no, not entirely, and I, I want, want to make sure that I pay proper tribute to um, th the current British government in the crisis. So they may not have foreseen um, uh, in their integrated review the risk of Russia invading Ukraine. They may not have seen um, in the integrated review, uh, a Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. But when the crisis, so they may, may not have been prepared, but when the crisis hit, the military in particular responded magnificently. And it links a little to my observations earlier on to a question. It's, it's partly about how much you spend, but it's how well you spend it. And um, the lesson that I think has been driven home to us in Britain, certainly to me, is that with the exception probably the US, potentially of China, actually... Um, no country can do anything effectively on its own. And that's certainly true for Britain. 
So uh, we may set against the U.S. contribution of weapons and 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 ammunition and su support and kit delivered into Ukraine. Uh, our U.K. contribution has been modest um, at best. But what we have done is used the sort of coordinating power that we had as a, a, a the British government very effectively to try and encourage other European allies to do more, to coordinate the logistics of some of the supply. than the Conservatives and the big task and test for our, our, our Labour Party now as the government's official opposition and a wannabe government after the next election is have we, can, can, can we, can we win sufficient public confidence and trust that were people to say we'll give you a go in government they have the confidence that we'll do what's necessary to, to keep the country safe, to keep them safe, in a way that less than three years ago they certainly didn't. Um, it won't win us the next election. People, by and large, don't vote to specifically on defence issues. But if people, if it's part of the public believing that a wannabe government isn't up to the job, won't do what I described to you earlier on as the first duty of any government, then it could be part of us failing to win the next election again. And I'm really determined, just as Keir Starmer is really determined, uh, that that will not happen. Thank you so very much, John Healy, for joining us for this discussion. It has been fascinating to hear your approach to the defense and security challenges ahead of us. You've given us not just analysis, but also <laughs> ideas, and we thank you for that. Because here at Wilson, we are all about ideas Indeed. in the policy realm. And thank you so much to our audience in the room and online, also for your great questions and participation. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.